Last time we talked about chromatic aberration and we discussed different ways that different wavelengths of light interact with glass in lenses and causes some maybe some undesirable effects and some color fringing. But what if we're not dealing with color, we're taking black and white photographs. Today we're going to be looking at some monochromatic aberrations that affect all light. Hey fellow photographers, what did you shoot today? So I actually had a friend ask me about the last video on chromatic aberration. Does chromatic aberration affect black and white images? And there's a long and short answer, and the short of it is not really. You're not going to see that color fringing effect on a black and white film or if you're, if you're you know, converting to black and white. The problem is that that color fringing, because all the light is not lining up of the different wavelengths, is lining up to the same spot you might have a perceived lack of sharpness. You know, you might have a little softness around the edges, uh, especially, you know, on those wide angle shots towards the edges of the frame. So let's talk about monochromatic aberrations. Now there's quite a few of them, so I'm not gonna go into deep detail on each one. I'll put out future videos discussing the details of each of these, but it's important to be aware of them. However, most modern lenses have corrected for a lot of these, so you're not gonna encounter these sort of deviations or aberrations in your pictures unless under extreme circumstances, which we'll also discuss. So let's start out with spherical aberration. And spherical aberration is kind of like the, one of the forms of chromatic aberration that we talked about, where rays of light are not going to all converge on this focal point. But this time we're not dealing with different wavelengths of light or color, we're dealing with light in general. And the idea is that light that enters towards the edge of a lens actually gets focused, it's overcorrected, if it's focused more than what is normally the focal point. So you have your light rays that come in like this, and you know, towards the middle of the lens, you know, you're gonna get things that are, that are pretty good, you know, they're gonna focus, but once you start going out to the edge of your lens, the images, the pictures on the edge of your frame, it, 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 does like a, it doesn't do as good a job. It starts overcorrecting, it starts bending this light a little too aggressively. Now again, most modern lenses are corrected for this behavior, so you're not gonna see this as much. But that's why you hear people say on lower quality lenses that things in the middle of the frame, the middle of the lens, are going to be the sharpest part of the image because usually this area here is essentially optimized for the focal point. You know, things that are in the center of your frame using the center part of the lens are gonna be accurately focused to the focal point. Things on the fringe, Unless you have high quality optics that have been corrected for this, you know, you might get some softness in the corners. So when people talk about sharpness and they talk about softness of lenses, you know, they usually say that the center of the lens is sharp, but it's soft at the edges. So that's something to be considerate of, because maybe some other lenses might be, you know, sharp from corner to corner, right? So you have the whole range, which means it's well corrected for spherical aberration. And in order to do that, you actually have special lens element shapes. So instead of our sort of biconvex, simple thin lens that we've been talking about in most examples, you kind of have a lens that's, you know, probably has something like that. So the backside is similar, but in order to combat all of these rays going differently, so the ones at the edge get bent more aggressively. So we don't have as steep a curve at the edge and then it actually we get more curvature something like that so it has almost like a like a dimple so this this would be you know kind of what your normal lens would look like the biconvex lens we're talking about but if we have a dimple on this lens we actually get rid of the uh, spherical aberration because now these lines out here that are getting bent aggressively let's say this is the focal point are now gonna match these lines because with this, with more curvature, this is actually going to bend more aggressively as well. So now everything kind of lines up and there's different mathematical calculations on how do you get that shape, but that's how it's corrected. So a good lens will have, you know, glass elements that are ground in order to, you know, exhibit this quality and have everything across the range in focus. If you don't have a good lens, and you, use the, you don't want to use just the center of the image because you want to get a lot of things in focus, we can always stop down, right, by putting an aperture here. So we're only letting in the middle part of the light. Now light from the edges will still be coming through. It's just going to be coming through towards the center of the lens. So you're actually going to get better focus by stopping down 
using a smaller aperture or a higher f-stop number. Aperture videos are coming up. It's the next lesson after lenses. So next on our list is coma. Now coma has to do with oblique light, light rays that are coming in at an angle. And this is kind of like the other chromatic aberration we're talking about, but again, this is just all light. And you know, this sort of image plane, when we focus the image plane, these points may not exactly line up. Now this might look really familiar because we talked about it in the last video, but that was separation by wavelength of light. This is just light in general. So what ends up happening is you have this, these images, these points don't line up and you actually get something like this. So you get like, you know, there's a spot of light here and this kind of spot of light kind of trails off as you get further and further away. Now that's, that's grossly exaggerated, but the reason it's called, you know, it's called coma is kind of has like a tail, like a comet. So if this is a comet and has the comet's tail, that's kind of where the shape comes from, a little like a teardrop shape. And this is for really, really minute, small point light sources. You're not gonna see a lot of this, this behavior when you're taking, let's say, landscapes. But this is a very important property for astrophotographers. So if you're trying to take pictures of the stars, which are little light points in the sky, you know, oblique light that's coming in from the angle on the wider parts of your frame, you know, toward, way off towards uh, the edge of the frame in space, these points of light are not gonna look like, you, they would look to your eye. They look like points of light to your eye little tiny stars off in the distance, but they're gonna have a little trail. They're not gonna look like a point of light. They're gonna look like this teardrop shape. So if you're very into astrophotography, then you might wanna consider lenses that exhibit this. And you can look at different uh, example shots of people who have used the lens. You can kind of get an idea from their MTF charts, how, how sharp and stuff the lenses are, how good they are at focusing but it's just something to be aware of. And the problem with this is with astrophotography, which we will talk about in future videos, is that you want to let in as much light as possible because those stars are so faint, so off in the distance. So you want to let in as much light. So one way to correct for this is to actually, again, you can solve a lot of problems by closing down an aperture, using only light from a smaller, narrower band, right? But that limits the amount of light that is, that is hitting the film plane or the, or the image sensor. So you're not really gonna be able to see those stars unless you lose really long uh, exposure times which would cause star trails and there would be actually movement because the Earth is rotating. So when it comes to astrophotography, you're looking for uh, lenses that have, um, they have wide, big pieces of glass, right? Low f-stop numbers, wide apertures. But that's going to introduce this problem unless that lens is specifically corrected for it. So just something to keep in mind for people who want to take those nice shots of the Milky Way. Next up is astigmatism. Now, I'm not going to draw our normal biconvex lens. I'm going to kind of draw an oval like this. And we have to, in order to demonstrate this, we're going to have to imagine this is sort of like a three-dimensional part of the lens here. And now our image plane is going off like this. And let's say our focus point is back here. So if you can imagine this is some sort of three-dimensional lens element. So it's like our biconvex lens that we're talking about just kind of rotated in space. Because what astigmatism means is that light rays that are perpendicular in nature don't line up to the same focal point. So let's draw what that looks like. So let's say we have light that, that's kind of, it's kind of coming in in this up and down plane, right? This slice of the lens. So the, the vertical component of the lens. Let's say that this focuses here, right? Well, on the other axis, sort of this horizontal axis here, light coming in from side to side may not focus to that point. You know, it may focus like that. So these points don't necessarily line up and they don't necessarily line up at the focal point. So different perpendicular planes of light aren't hitting the same focal point, which is a problem. Now this issue is something that you don't really hear about in modern lenses with complex lens designs because way back in the day, all the way since 1890, this has essentially been corrected. Uh, Carl Zeiss, the lens manufacturer, uh, essentially released lenses that were corrected for this issue and since then those designs have been used 
uh, and expand it upon. So this isn't really an issue you see every day, but it's important to kind of know these properties of lenses to see kind of why complex lenses are the way they are. Now, does that mean that more elements in a lens is better? Uh, that's a question for another video. But uh, astigmatism is sort of the parallel, I mean, the perpendicular light rays from different planes not focusing the same point. All right, so next up is Petzval field curvature. Now, essentially what that means is that light coming in, you know, parallel to the optical axis is going to do a good job of focusing at the focal plane. However, you can kind of think of this distance here, this focal length distance, as the, as the radius of a circle. So there's like a curve here. This is where the term field curvature comes in. So that off-axis light is actually not necessarily optimized for this focal plane. It might actually be more focused towards where this field is. Again, that means that things that are in the center of the lens and that are you're looking straight down the camera lens, through the lens, they're going to be in focus. But stray light from all around, you know, that's coming in at different angles, is actually not going to be focused to that plane. And this results in Petzl field curvature. And this is what some people refer to as swirly bokeh. So we haven't talked about bokeh and out of focus areas because that's going to be saved for the aperture discussions and videos. But it's just something to know that your center of the uh, image will be sharp as long as you're shooting straight on. But everything coming in from the sides is going to look pretty weird. Now again, it's the same kind of story. This field curvature issue is actually almost eliminated for most modern lenses. And because this is a problem dating back to the late 1800s. And you know, since then there have been plenty of iterations and people want everything in the focal plane, you know, in acceptable focus. They don't want these swirling aberrations, these kind of like out of focus blur. Um, people don't want that. It can be used to creative effect, but generally speaking, when you want an accurate representation of what you see and how you see it to the human eye, this is a huge problem. However, because this is the Science of Photography channel, it would be remiss of me not to bring up the fact that certain camera manufacturers are actually experimenting with the idea of curved film planes, curved digital film sensors. So instead of something like this, you could actually have maybe not something this exaggerated, but you could actually have you know, a film plane that might mimic sort of this field curvature problem. And uh, I'll put some patents up that show that this is actually being actively developed. Now, why would this be the case? Well, you might be able to get some creative effects, or you might be able to get cheaper lenses. You may be able to, may be able to manufacture lenses that don't have to be so corrected, so optimal, so uh, precision manufactured. You can actually use fewer elements, less glass, less materials, and with the sensor curve, now that we have the technology, with the sensor curved, it can actually correct for all of this in camera. So it'd be interesting to see what comes out of this new technology, and we might see a resurgence of lenses that actually are not corrected for this. In fact, we already have. So they've remade the Petzval lens, which is this lens here, the new Petzval. This is the uh, 85 millimeter Petzval lens, sort of a portrait lens. It's got a really cool sort of rack and pinion focusing system here. But essentially, because this look can be used for creative uses, it kind of gives a, a, almost a surreal feel. You know, the people over at, um, you know, there's a Kickstarter or something like that. And, you know, I don't know if Lomography is, is the, the owner of this now, but they've, they've produced this lens and it actually produces some pretty interesting images. The next video, we're going to actually talk a deep dive into this lens because it is so significant for the history of photography. This, you know, this design was the first mathematically calculated lens before it was just guess and check. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a huge deal. So we're going to de dedicate a whole episode to this lens. So, so stay tuned for that next week. Now, in modern times, we don't really worry about that. But it's interesting because, you know, having that lens now allows us to sort of appreciate some creative aspects of it and not have to be so technically perfect. All right, so the last thing I want to just briefly introduce in this video, and it probably deserves its whole own video about how to recognize this, how to correct for it, but it's going to be distortion in general. And distortion, we're now talking, instead of the lenses, we're talking about how that image is projected onto the film plane. 
or the image sensor. So here we're looking at sort of like, this is like the cross hairs of, you know, this is the sort of the film or image sensor, right? So imagine that this is what it is. So there are typically two types of distortion and a third, which is the combination of the two. So we have uh, barrel distortion, which is where the lines are not sort of parallel or perpendicular. They don't make a nice grid pattern as you normally would, you know, lines end up being straight. And what happens is we kind of get this, this bowing out effect and it kind of gets more exaggerated towards the edges. So there's actually lenses that use this to their advantage. So this is barrel distortion. And barrel distortion is actually used by fisheye lenses to kind of get that whole wrap, sort of all the light pulls it in and it kind of gives that globe view. If you've ever seen those circular fisheye images, that actually uses this distortion to its advantage in order to give a creative aspect and capture a huge angle of view of light. But for most applications, unless again, you're trying to be creative or you're being very specialized, this is not necessarily a desirable effect. So uh, we'll also talk about how to recognize this in future videos and how to correct for it. Lightroom has some interesting tools for doing that. So we have barrel distortion and then sort of the opposite where these fields start to bow inwards is called pincushion distortion. So pincushion distortion is where things kind of bend inwards like this. And I think a lot of wide angle lenses generally suffer from pincushion distortion. And why is it called pincushion? Well, it's supposed to look like the corners of a cushion are being pinched towards the edges. So this, you can kind of see, right? That's why it's called pincushion. Whatever, just hit my light. <laughs> So the third type of distortion, which we'll put down here, but I kind of filled up the board with space, is what they call mustache distortion. So mustache is kind of exhibits a little bit of both. So in the middle, you might have some sort of, you know, bowing out like this, but then towards the edges, you're starting to flare out like you would with the pincushion. You get the idea. Basically, it's all sorts of messed up and distorted. So mustache distortion is when it exhibits sort of both properties. So that was our overview of monochromatic aberrations and how they affect images. If there's any one in particular that interests you, like maybe you're an astrophotographer and you want to talk about coma, or you, you kind of see this bowing out in your images and you want to want to know how to correct that distortion, let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll prioritize sort of that video. Remember next week we're going to talk about the Petzval lens, which is a huge and important part of photographic history. And there's a lot of science behind it as well. I hope these videos prove useful as we slowly but surely build our knowledge base about cameras and photography with the ultimate goal of being able to use that knowledge and apply it to get the photographs we want. So if you find these videos helpful, please consider subscribing to this channel, liking it, and also leaving comments about what could be improved, what you would like to see, or anything else that's on your mind. But until then, as always, happy shooting.